Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. So, uh, late Tuesday night, you and I were texting about how excited we were to talk about Georgia today. But we have been robbed of the joy from those victories by a mob of violent extremists who are encouraged to stage an insurrection against the United States government by the man who was supposed to be leading it. And so that is what we have to talk about first. The congressional certification of the Electoral College votes on Wednesday should have been a routine event. It usually is. But Donald Trump and well over 100 Republicans in Congress, led by Senators Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz, decided that they would object to the election results in an effort to overturn the will of the voters. Donald Trump also urged his supporters multiple times to descend on Washington over the last week, saying, quote, be there, it will be wild. Then on Wednesday morning, while Congress gathered to certify the election, Trump incited a mob of his supporters outside of the White House, many of them armed, and told them to march towards the Capitol to, quote, give our Republicans the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. And they did. And they clashed with Capitol Police, and shots were fired, and four people died, and the entire United States Congress, along with the Vice President, either barricaded themselves in offices or were evacuated from the Capitol, while Trump supporters stormed the building carrying weapons, Trump flags, and Confederate flags. Pipe bombs were later discovered and detonated at the Capitol, the Republican National Committee, and the Democratic National Committee. It was the first time the U.S. Capitol had been breached since the British invaded during the War of 1812, except this time the invaders were extremists who had been incited by the President of the United States. So that's where we are, Dan. <laughs> um, I will, uh, I'll stop there and let you react to uh, what you saw unfold yesterday. It watching that everything that happened yesterday was a mix of emotions. It was incredibly scary, right? You and I have both worked in that building. We both yeah. worked in that building after 9 11. And the idea that people could just walk right in there and take it over with all the security that's been put in place is incredibly scary. It was sad and just a terribly like I had viewed what was going to happen simply with just the overly ambitious snake oil salesman trying to uh, overturn the will of the voters in an impotent display of authoritarianism as a dark day for democracy. But when you have an armed insurrection egged on by the President of the United States, like that is an incredibly sad day for democracy. And on top of all of that, it was absolutely infuriating because it was yeah. so predictable, so preventable, and we we knew we were headed in this direction for years now and all of the various stakeholders in the Republican party in the right wing media at the social media platforms just stood by and watched it happen and ignored the warnings. And we ended up in incriminating space. And we are so incredibly fortunate for as horrible as yesterday was that it wasn't so much worse. There was so much, there could have been so much more carnage or could have been, I mean, there were bombs, there were guns like th as horrible as it was, it, was a fraction of how horrible it could have been if a couple of things had gone differently. I also find myself, I was scared at times, a lot of times, but really, really angry. Um, you know, when we, we talked about this Monday on Monday's pod and, you know, like when I thought about the certification process and Holly and Cruz, like I was, I remain enraged at those fucking people. Um, but I was like, these assholes are going to stretch out the process and then they're going to be voted down. There's no chance they succeed. There's no chance that fucking Pence delivers the victory to Donald Trump that Donald Trump thinks Pence could have, but he can anyway. Like, all that was just, it's fucking upsetting, but it's garbage. At the end of the pod, we said something like, if you're in D.C., be careful. Because I, I did think about the crowds that were coming to D.C., and that worried me more than what was actually going on in, in the Congress. And, you know, I was texting with mutual friends of ours in D.C., um, our friend Mike Gottlieb, who was like, yeah, I'm thinking of just getting the family out of here on Wednesday because it's going to be so bad. And I was like, oh, God, that is going to be bad. Um, and then we saw this happen. I mean, like one of one, the tweet that really summed it up for me uh, shared a lot from someone named Ed Stern. He said, well, that escalated steadily for four years. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah. Like and the, the scary thing about it, though, is we we all knew it was coming, something like this was eventually going to happen. We were all afraid of it. We've all, and when I say we, Democrats, 
journalists, a lot of Republicans, but never Trump Republicans, like a wide, wide, people all over the world saw this coming, saw this kind of thing coming someday. And yet we couldn't stop it, right? Like there, we were almost powerless to stop this. Well, we didn't mainly, try. We tried. Well, mainly because the only way to have stopped this was to have impeached this man any time over the last four years and Republicans protected him. Too many Republicans protected him. It is, it is the reason to this day that he remains a threat to this nation because too many members of the Republican Party, too many elected Republicans have chosen to protect this man. And so the rest of us have to sit here and worry that something like this could happen um, and we are powerless to do anything about it until he leaves office. And that's what's really, that's what's really awful. And by the way, it didn't just happen in D.C., the state houses in Georgia, in Kansas, in other parts of the country. Um, there were Trump mobs there too. Raffensperger, the Secretary of State in Georgia, had to be escorted out of the state house there to protect him. Um, and just, you know, what happened in the Capitol building was just fucking atrocious. They vandalized offices. They were down on the Senate floor. They were in Pelosi's office. They wrote murder the media on a door in big letters. I mean, it was revolting. It was revolting. And my, I think my first question is, out of many questions, <laughs> like, there were thousands of people at the Capitol. There were 26 arrests on Capitol grounds on Wednesday. Only 26. How did the Capitol Police fail to secure an event that was being attended by the entire United States Congress, the current Vice President of the United States, and the next Vice President of the United States? I mean, this was like a president and nine Supreme Court justices short of a State of the Union, which is the most closely guarded, heavily guarded event in America every year. What the fuck was going on? I mean, it was clearly one of the greatest security failures in modern American history. Since, since 9-11. I mean, worse than 9-11. Like just it like it's nine eleven. If they had told you nine eleven was going to happen and you didn't prepare for it, right? Yeah, and like there needs to be an investigation into what happened with the Capitol Police. Why were they? Why did they fail to prepare? Why were some of the cops taking selfies with the protesters? There are there are videos that we that lack context. So you want to know more about it about them opening the gates and letting people in? Why did that happen? I mean, there needs to be an investigation. There needs to be accountability. And there absolutely needs to be changes at the top of the Capitol Police. This is your job, right? And I, like, when I worked for uh, the Senate Minority Leader, he was protected by the Capitol Police 24-7. I spent a lot of time with him. There are a lot of really, really good people who work at the Capitol Police who do a really good job. But from top to bottom, this was a gigantic failure. And we need to know why. Because the, the members' lives were at risk. Like, I read an Instagram post from the daughter-in-law of Congresswoman Madeline Dean, whose son we used to work with, about her calling her family from her office, barricaded in her office as people were banging on the door and she and her staff were afraid for their lives. Like that is the situation we were in. There's another story I read today about how this is one of the greatest cybersecurity failures in history because we lost complete control of all of the computers in, the, in one of the branches of the United States government for hours. And we have no idea what happened to those computers if something happened to them. Just, t just an absolute failure where we lost control of the home of one of our three branches of government. It is unbelievable. And I do think, and you, this is related to the question around arrests, is there is an inherent level of racism in how this played. Right? These were white protesters. Right. So people were yeah. talking about this on Twitter yesterday. One of our friends texted us about it, about how D.C. police surrounded a home in D.C. for an entire night because there were 100 yeah. protesters holed up inside. And these people were helped down the steps as they left after engaging in an armed occupation of the United States Capitol. Well, and it's, it, it is systemic at every level, right, because there are. Uh, you know, a lot of questions need to be answered. The question about the selfies, the question about the, there's a video of cops opening the gate. And then there's also videos too of cops trying to push the crowd back and just being completely overrun, right? Now, Capitol Police says a bunch of their members were out because of fucking COVID. So they had less police than they usually have. But also um, their police force was amped up from like a couple hundred to 2000 after 9-11 just forced this very scenario for a scenario just like this. So even when the cops were trying to push them back, they were overrun. Um, the cops were like, you know, firing tear gas. They did obviously shoot some woman in the chest um, who died. And so, but like, even when they were trying, they did not have the numbers they needed, nor did they act the way they should have 
to stop an invading force when the entire U.S. Congress was inside. The entire fucking U.S. Congress. Democrats, Republicans, the two vice presidents. <laughs> I just... I, it's, it's staggering. It's staggering. There should be a full-fledged investigation into it as soon as possible. Most of the line of succession was in the was in that building, and yeah. there was no protection for it. But there is an so interview let, with, the, with the most recent uh, chief of the Capitol Police in the Washington Post that, where she just destroys their entire preparation for it and cannot figure out why they set the barricade so close to the Capitol. Why weren't they off the Capitol grounds that they've been in pre- many, many previous protests? Peaceful, of course. And it's just an incredibly dangerous failure that could have been as terrible as it was could have been so much worse on so many levels. I also read in the Washington Post too, that the DC police, which sort of, you know, sort of guard the perimeter around outside, but they don't guard the Capitol itself. They knew because of all the posts, all of Trump's posts, that things were getting bad. They were worried that the Capitol Police did not have shit under control. But the D.C. Police, of course, weren't brought in until the evening to, to settle things down. Uh, it's also like one of the most heavily guarded cities in the world, aside from D.C. Police and the Capitol Police. There's FBI, there's SWAT teams, there's fucking like all the goons that were out this summer that were in plain clothes that Bill Barr sent out. Uh, to take care of Black Lives Matter protesters, they were all around too. And a lot of them were sent in, but they were sent in, of course, after the fucking invaders had already taken the Capitol. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, let's talk about the fallout. So there were statements of condemnation and disgust from other countries, which were pretty hard to take and hard to read as an American. Uh, there were statements of condemnation from former Presidents Obama, Bush, Clinton, from Democratic and Republican members of Congress who did finish the certification after the Capitol was clear on Wednesday night. Um, 121 House Republicans still voted to overturn the election when they got back from being, um, you know, targets of an insurrection. Still voted to overturn the election, though only six Republican senators voted to do so, including, of course, Cruz and Hawley. So here's my question on this one. What surprised you more, the 121 House members who voted that way uh, after they were targets of an insurrection, or the fact that every Republican senator but six came around to the sane position on this? I, I, I mean, this is a sad thing to say, but there's almost nothing surprising that the right wing of the Republican Party can do. Of course they still did this, right? Because the political incentives that put them in this position still exist. And... Right. There is, I guess, Michael, here's, like, I have a question for you, actually. What was your reaction to seeing those statements of condemnation from former Republicans, current Republicans, uh, people who have supported Trump? So I am, uh, which there should come as no surprise to you, I am certainly not in the like, now they're heroes camp that some people seem to be in <laughs> uh, these days. But I think what happened is, look, when, when you're the one barricading yourself in a fucking office because there's goons outside who are coming to get you and they don't care that you're a Republican who supported Trump because they are extremists who like only answer to fucking, you know, their cult leader, Donald Trump, and they'll mow down a Republican just as fast as they'll mow down a Democrat. You know, like I think there are some Republicans who partly because at least the Republican members of Congress who partly because they experienced yesterday firsthand thought, you know what, this has now gotten out of hand and we've now got to stop this. And look, and some of them got, some of them came to that realization before the Capitol was taken. So, you know, Mitch McConnell had clearly had enough of this shit and gave a speech yesterday morning about how, a uh, little too late, Mitch, little too late. Uh, but Mitch McConnell gave a speech about how like, we're, we're not overturning the election, we're moving on, all this other shit, you know. Um, Mitt Romney has been, I will say, courageous, a patriot through all this, and it was outrage. Like his outrage was real yesterday. Um, set, you know, not just saying like some leaders have caused this, basically saying the president did this. This is the president's fault. But like Mitt Romney has been there for a while. So I do think that like basically Republicans divided up into two camps yesterday. They were the ones who thought, you know what. I was on this train, but now shit's gotten too far, and this is actually a little scary even for me. And then the ones who were like, you know, the fucking Matt Gateses of the world and the House Republicans and Ted fucking Cruz and Josh fucking Hawley who were like, yeah, you know what? It was, uh, it was, it was probably Antifa 
Yeah, it was Antifa that did it. It wasn't uh, it wasn't uh, Trump loyalists. It was Antifa. And this is fine. And oh, come on. And both sides are to blame. And blah, blah, blah. You know, all that bullshit. And that is the core of the Republican Party. And that's probably the part of the Republican Party that will remain successful politically uh, in the months and years to come, sadly. My reaction is probably similar, but a little different. I I view most of those statements as just pure CYA. They it's just, possible. They, and I don't I'm know sure there I, I, I honestly, I, I have no idea what goes on in these people's heads anymore. I just can't. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think we should be appreciative for people who speak out, right? If they do it sincerely, like I think Mitt Romney legitimately did it sincerely. George W. Bush, sincere in this. Um, Ted Cruz's statement condemning the violence did not seem to be dripping with sincerity no, to me. No, fuck him. He didn't condemn the violence. He didn't, then he fucking started tweeting at Beto, like, you're dividing people. Your rhetoric is divisive. Fuck Ted Cruz. Fuck Ted Cruz. But here is, this This is my reaction, which is, thank you for your statement. Can I get an iota of self-reflection for how we got to this moment? Right, Because right. all of right. those Republicans, Mitt Romney included, bear some responsibility for this because I think one of the dangers of this entire situation you fucking you rode the tiger you rode the tiger the danger of the situation is we make it entirely about Trump Trump lit the match that started this but all of these Republicans for more than a decade have been pouring the gas on the ground that led him do it right every Republican for as far back as we can imagine who has been talking about fake voter fraud in order to justify disenfranchising your opponent's voters bear responsibility for this. Fox News bears responsibility for this. The social media platforms that have allowed Americans to be willingly and knowingly allowed Americans to be radicalized by the spreading of conspiracy theories are responsible for this. Weaponizing conspiracy theories and racial animus for political gain was the Republican playbook long before Donald Trump ever showed up. Benghazi is a conspiracy theory. Birtherism is a conspiracy theory. They've been doing this forever. And this is where we got here. And if we are in this situation, we'll talk about this in terms of the 25th Amendment impeachment, where it's like, we're going to get Trump's hands off the wheel and we're going to be okay. We are deeply fucking mistaken because the forces that gave us Trump are getting worse, not better. Yeah. And look, this is, I mean, what's truly insidious about this is that most of these Republican leaders and right-wing media figures know what they are peddling is a lie. We said it before, like few people have more contempt for Republican voters and the Republican base than Republican politicians and the right-wing media figures who profit off of all of this bullshit. And every day they wake up and they tell millions of Americans these lies. And so if you're someone who's a Trump voter, if you're someone who watches Fox News, you're on fucking 8chan. You're on one of these platforms. You listen to Donald Trump. You listen to Louis Gomer. You listen to Ted Cruz. What do you think the world is? What do you think the world is? You think the world is a bunch of radical Democrats who hate you, who are dangerous, or worse, pedophiles, uh, socialists. They're coming to get you. They're stealing an election from you. They hate you. They're going to come into their suburbs and kill you. That's what you hear day after day after day, conspiracy after conspiracy, and there is no one to tell these people that it is a lie. No one will tell them it's a lie because the Republican politicians want their votes, and even though they know it's a lie, they just fucking say it anyway, and they keep saying it. And you know what? Like, good for Mitt Romney, who, you're right, like, he went down this path in 2012 as well, but at least, like, he has since seen, <laughs> seen the danger of this, and last night during his speech, he made that same point. He's like, these are lies that we are telling these voters. We are lying to them. And that is at the core of this, is that these people are being lied to. And Fox News, fucking Fox News was still lying to them last night. Tucker Carlson still last night was telling them that it was Antifa that infiltrated this. Tucker Carlson was still telling them that these people are going to take away, they're going to use this uh, infiltration of the Capitol to take away your rights. You work at fucking Fox News right now, and your network is telling people that after, after a mob storm the Capitol, you should fucking look yourself in the mirror and ask why you're working at Fox News. If you consider yourself a fucking straight news reporter or a producer or anyone who works at that network or any of the fucking Democrats who have contracts at that network. Like. You know, and there is such a desire, probably because politics is narrated and covered by liberal arts majors like us to, to sort of 
set the whole thing into a world of protagonists and antagonists. There's a hero's journey, right. et cetera. And so Trump is the bad guy. And then we're constantly, so we're so desperate for some good guys from the other side because that fits with the narrative, which is why when Mitch McConnell gave his speech before the violence really took over, he gave his speech condemning what Cruz and Hawley were doing and saying except the election results. And all these reporters are like, this is the most important speech Mitch McConnell has ever given. Ugh. Bullshit. The most important speech Mitch McConnell has should have given is the one he should have given right after the election when he could have told voters to accept the results that all that these were lies. They let all of this happen because they thought they could leverage it politically and it almost burned down the Capitol. Right. This is not just like it hurt them politically. They lost the Georgia elections. It almost it brought our government to heal for hours. Yeah. I mean, that, that like you're, you're absolutely right. Like this this whole thing could have been avoided with a couple of speeches from a couple of Republicans the day after the election, the day after the election. And Mitch McCall just thought, what, why? Why? Because they wanted to win Georgia. That's why. They thought they, need, they needed the base excited so that they could win Georgia. Well, you lost Georgia, and, and you, almost, yep. you almost burned down the U.S. government. So, so you're, guess you miscalculated, you're, Mitch. Yeah, you're a craven asshole, and you're bad at politics. <laughs> Let's talk about Trump's reaction. He spent most of the day... Angry at Mike Pence while this was all going on for not trying to unilaterally overturn the election for him. He refused to approve Washington, D.C.'s request for National Guard troops to help. So Mike Pence and the Secretary of Defense went around him and approved the request themselves and then put out a statement. The, 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 the acting Secretary of Defense put out a statement saying, I've been t in touch with Mike Pence and the congressional leaders about... Uh, protecting the Capitol, didn't mention Donald Trump because Donald Trump was so angry and pissed and happy that this was going on, reports that, that Donald Trump was pleased this was happening. So they went. So Donald Trump wasn't part of protecting the Capitol because he was too pissed. Um, he was forced finally by his staff to send out a few very tepid tweets and a video where he told the extremists that he loved them, but that they should go home. And then he tweeted... Like, this is what happens when you steal an election, basically, was his tweet. We don't know what that tweet is now because it was finally deleted from Twitter. And then uh, Twitter temporarily banned him from Twitter and Facebook. And both platforms have threatened to permanently ban him if he continues to violate their rules. I was prepping this morning, so I can't, I can't keep up with this. But I think Facebook now said he's banned indefinitely and he's back on Twitter. I, I don't know what's going on. This morning, Mark Zuckerberg announced that Instagram and Facebook were suspending Trump for at least two weeks and potentially indefinitely. Twitter, it's not entirely clear what has happened. He had a 12-hour ban, I think, as of yesterday. And with, I don't know, by the time, this will probably be in a different iteration by the time this podcast comes out. But I would not be shocked if, if Twitter followed fit the lead of Facebook on this because usually they're slightly ahead of Facebook, which is still way too late on some of these deplatforming issues, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. And I will say, and, and great, great for Twitter, great for Facebook. Like, you know, as one of our friends noted, it, it sort of, it seemed, it felt calmer last night <laughs> that Trump wasn't on Twitter continuing to rile things up. Um, though, as, as Tommy also pointed out, like this whole thing started uh, not necessarily because of his tweets, but because he got up in front of the White House at that rally and told people to go storm the fucking Capitol. <laughs> and so, like, the guy can still go to the briefing room and cause trouble. So he is, so the, it, it's good that he's off Twitter, it's good that he's off Facebook, but he is still a threat. So the question is, what can be done about Donald Trump? He's got 14 days left. Um, probably a few less, yeah, 16 now. Uh, there have been calls for impeachment among Democrats, uh, including uh, minority leader, soon-to-be majority leader Chuck Schumer, uh, and even some Republicans, though not too many publicly there, uh, there have been reports that cabinet officials and White House officials are talking about invoking the 25th Amendment. There have been White House resignations uh, overnight and rumored cabinet resignations. What the fuck can we do here? <laughs> Should Trump be impeached or removed from office? Yes. And that was true yeah, before definitely. this happened. It's even more true now. Is he most definitely unfit for the job of, of protecting and leading America? 100%. And should the 25th Amendment been be true invoked? since 2015? Yes. <laughs> yes. Are those things going to happen? Yeah. It's just worth noting that you need 
17 Republicans? Well, I've been going back and forth on this. So yeah, you need 19 with the current Senate, 17 if uh, Ossoff and Warnock are seated. So basically you need... 24 hours ago, there were 12 Republican senators who refused to acknowledge Joe Biden's legitimate election. So it's hard right. to imagine. Now where, we're going to get 17 to convict. Yes. 19, 17. That seems very, very challenging. Uh, Igor Bobich last night asked Mitt Romney on the way out of the Senate, Mitt Romney being the one Republican who voted to convict last time, last impeachment, because now we're talking about a second impeachment. And Donald Trump gets two impeachments. Um, and he said, you know, I think... That's really hard to do right now. I think we all have to just hold our breath for the next 14 days, is what Romney said. So if you have the person who convicted last time, the Republican who convicted last time, saying, I don't think it's possible this time, I don't know where you're going to find an additional 16 or 17 Republicans in the Senate to convict this man. And look, if the House wants to gavel into session and impeach Donald Trump as a symbolic gesture, as a purely symbolic gesture, which is what it would be, I'm for it. If I was in the House, I would vote for that resolution for sure. Um, but that's all that it, let's, let's not kid ourselves. That's all it would be. Um, I don't think you're going to get 17 senators. Uh, but like, look, if you want to pass the resolution and then drop it in Mitch McConnell's lap and make him be the one to say, no, we're going to not convict Donald Trump. I think that's fine. I think that's fine. But look, and, and, you know, and Tommy pointed this out on Monday. It's, it's not just to remove the threat over the next, um, 13 days. It is to, if, if Donald Trump is impeached and convicted, if he's convicted, he will never be allowed to run for any office again. And I do think it is worth trying to prevent him to make sure that he does not come back in 2024 and run again. Maybe you can sell that to Cruz, Hawley. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Tom Cotton. Yeah, I mean, that, it's a good point. My brother made this point to me. He's like, why yeah. wouldn't they want him out of the picture in 2024? You know, like what? <laughs> what? It is. Look, I think you back to your question earlier about um, some of these Republican statements. Like Georgia plays a big role here too. Donald Trump is of very little use to any of these Republicans right now. He cost them two Senate seats or helped cost them two Senate seats, let's say. We're going to get into this. Um, in Georgia, cost them a majority, destroyed the House majority in 2018, lost in the Senate majority in 2020, one-term president. The party is now in tatters. Um, and a bunch of them want to run for president in 2024. Now, they do want his voters, so they don't want to piss his voters off, which drives everything that they do. Every fucking destructive move they make is about his fucking voters. Um, but, like, what good is Donald Trump to these people now, anyway? Well, I was reading this morning, I think from Jake Sherman, that up until yesterday, Kevin McCarthy's plan for taking the House back was to work hand in glove with Donald Trump to raise money for the House, to rally in Republican districts. Like he was a huge part of their plan. And the question is, what what does that mean? I I just want to prepare everyone's expectations for this. Yeah. Is they are all going right back to him in a couple of months. That like they will find some grievance about Biden or some tweet of near attendance and that'll send them right back into Trump's lap, right? Like that, we should just be prepared for that because this is about where the political winds are blowing. And if you are a Republican who is in a safe district and your political fear is not a Democrat in the general election, it's a MAGA Republican in the primary, this pushes you in that direction. And Donald, there are going to be candidates running Look, Doug, take the, take the Georgia gubernatorial election in 2022. Yeah. Doug Collins, yeah. this report, is almost certainly going to run against Brian Kemp. You think Donald Trump is not going to campaign for Doug Collins and Doug Collins is not going to want D him there? And then if Doug Collins wins that primary and Stacey Abrams is the, is the Democratic nominee, you don't think Donald Trump's going to be on the stump in Georgia campaigning against no, Stacey Abrams? Well, it, that is probably to our, to our benefit, but he's not going anywhere. Right. No, he's not going anywhere, and all these Republicans are going to love him. I think maybe maybe the only hope here is the narrow group of Republicans who want to be president instead of him in the Senate. <laughs> want yes, to yes, yes. Him. And that, yes. Right, that might be the only, just purely pure self-interested. Yes. Now, let's talk about the 25th Amendment because I see that going around a lot, and we just got to talk about the 25th Amendment. 25th Amendment of the Constitution is provides for line of succession, removal of the president in case the president falls ill or dies or something like that. So... What ha here's what happens. If, um, if a majority of the cabinet 
decides that the president is unfit to serve. Uh, and now when the amendment was conceived, it could either be because the president like has a stroke and is, you know, in, in the hospital and not conscious or because he's Donald Trump and a fucking lunatic. Take your take your pick. So if a majority of the cabinet, including the vice president, decides that the president is unfit to serve, they transmit a letter to Congress saying so. Vice president takes power. Then there is then Trump gets a move. If the president then says, no, no, I am fit to serve, and these people are trying to stage a coup, the president sends a letter to Congress saying, oh, I am fit to serve. And then what happens is Congress, if they're not already convened, must reconvene within 48 hours. And then, if, and then Congress basically has to vote to keep the president out of power, needs a two-thirds vote in each house to say, yes, Donald Trump is unfit to serve. So you're not going to get that vote two-thirds vote in the House. That's, that's, that's harder than impeachment because impeachment, you need two-thirds in the Senate, but you need a majority in the House. To, keep, to, to maintain the 25th, you need two-thirds in both chambers, which you're not going to get. But the only thing here is it also says in the Constitution that Congress has 21 days to make that judgment and to take that vote. So if the cabinet did this, if Pence did this, Nancy Pelosi could just dick around for 21 days uh, before taking the vote, and we'd hit the 20th, and that would be that. Donald Trump wouldn't be in power for those days. Mike Pence would. So you could, if you want, like go through the cabinet list, Donald Trump's cabinet, and see uh, there's 15 of them, including uh, the chief of staff gets to be a cabinet member in this administration. Uh, obviously, Mark Meadows isn't voting against him. See if you can find eight votes in the cabinet to uh, you know say that Donald Trump is unfit to serve. I was I was doing it. Were you were you looking at the list? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just for it was a fun game. I was just kind of looking through it, like, hmm. But there's there's not a lot. Like Regina Haspel do it at CIA, probably. Steve Mnuchin after he embarrassed him, maybe. Alex Azar after he embarrassed him, yeah, maybe. But like Pompeo, DeVos, I don't know. <laughs> so could you imagine if? We survive this moment as a country and we stop the planet from melting underneath our feet. And like a hundred years from now, school kids are learning why this guy was president for like eight days at the end, having to explain this moment to them. <sighs> so anyway, I mean, look, I think what Romney said last night is probably correct, which is that we, the, the practical effect of all this is going to be that we're going to have to hold our breath for the next uh, the next 13 days. We should also say that late last night, I think four in the morning Eastern, the White House did release a statement from Donald Trump saying, pledging an orderly and peaceful transition and saying that he would leave on the 20th, which don't know how they got that statement out, don't know how much it means, don't know how fast he basically retracts it when he gets back on Twitter, but that is where we are as of, um, let's see, 1030 Pacific Coast time today on Thursday. <laughs> Is Donald Trump pledging an orderly transition on the 20th? Um, question about long term. Like, what do we do about this violence? What do we do about this extremism? Um, what does Joe Biden do to try to heal this country? He did speak yesterday um, as, this was, as this was happening. And I think we have a clip of Biden's speech. The scenes of chaos at the Capitol do not reflect a true America do not represent who we are. What we're seeing are a small number of extremists dedicated to lawlessness. This is not dissent. It's disorder. It's chaos. It borders on sedition. And it must end now. What do you think of Biden's speech and what do you think of the path ahead for him in trying to piece all this back together. His speech was great. And some of the things that frustrate a lot of Democrats about Joe Biden in the primary are why he, and sometimes us, frustrate us in the primary too sometimes. Yeah. But that is why he is, he is the person best suited to this moment. He is someone who approaches things with decency and not anger. His natural instincts is unity and forgiveness. And that is the right temperament for this. He is never someone who's going to throw gasoline on a, on a fire. He's going to always try to sort of appeal to the better angels people. Even when those people have demonstrated no evidence of having angels, he is going to try to do that. And he should continue to do that. I think we all have to understand, and I imagine that Joe Biden does understand this as well, is that the solution to this problem 
is not something that happens within the traditional bounds of quote unquote normal politics. We are, we are not a tour of red states away from unity. We are not more drinks yes. with Mitch McConnell away from unity. This, we are no. not one infrastructure, bipartisan infrastructure or bill away from solving this problem. This problem is endemic to American society. It is something that includes politics, it's driven by politics, but goes much beyond politics. And we have to really take a step back, all of us, right? This is not a problem for Joe Biden in the White House to solve and think about how we fix it because our country is coming apart at the seams. We have, we had an armed insurrection in the Capitol yesterday by people who believe, most of them, to their core, something that is provably not true. And that lie was spread all across this country by a broken media ecosystem, by social media platforms, by politicians who knew better. And none of that is going to get better on its own. We are not 14 days or however many it is from normalcy. Right? We have, there is a lot of work to do. I don't know that anyone, I certainly don't have the answers to this, but it is much bigger than one person sitting in the White House starting in two weeks. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I sort of have a few specific things and then one larger thing. Like, we need to regulate these social media platforms and not just, like, wait and hope that, like, out of the goodness of their heart, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and, and, uh, and, and Jack are going to suddenly decide to, like, implement policies that protect people and, and, and stop, you know, the incitement of hate and violence. Uh, so there needs to be some regulation of these platforms. I think we need more pressure on right-wing media. I think there needs to be more competition for right-wing media from progressive media. You and I have said this a million times. Uh, it's why we do this. I think the next Department of Justice, um, we're going to talk about Merrick Garland in a bit, and the FBI have to go back to taking white nationalism and right-wing extremism seriously, surveilling it, going after it. It is a incredibly dangerous threat to this country from within, and that needs to be a priority. Um, and then, you know, then the work of the work of elections and the work of democracy, right? Like I, I, I think that, as you said, like the odds are that we will face this kind of hate and violence again. And the sad truth is it's always been a part of who we are as a country. Um, but you know, our friend, uh, Ben Rhodes pointed us out yesterday, tweeted, there's always two competing stories about America. And, you know, we're a country of slavery and civil war and Jim Crow and horrific racist violence. But, you know, we're also the country of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis. And ultimately, I think politics is about us choosing between those competing stories. And the story we, that we chose on Tuesday night looked very different than Wednesday's. And it was almost poetic, right? Like, Donald Trump ends the November election by trying to disenfranchise millions of voters, specifically suing to throw out ballots in majority black areas like Detroit and Philadelphia and Milwaukee. Meanwhile, Mitch McConnell's Senate majority depends on two Georgia senators who have literally profited off the pandemic while denying relief to disproportionately poor and black and brown citizens of Georgia who are hurting most. And one of them, Kelly Leffler, runs one of the most racist campaigns in memory against her black opponent. And what happens on Tuesday? A multiracial coalition of whites and Latinos and Asians and more black voters than have ever voted in any election in any state ever <laughs> turn out to end Mitch McConnell's majority by electing a young Jewish kid who worked for John Lewis and the first black Democratic senator from the South who literally preaches from Martin Luther King Jr.'s pulpit. And that's America, too. Um, and I think we have a good clip of uh, Warnock from his uh, victory speech. But the other day, because this is America, the 82-year-old hands that used to pick somebody else's cotton went to the polls and picked her youngest son to be a United States Senator. So I come before you tonight as a man who knows that the improbable journey that led me to this place in this historic moment in America could only happen here. We were told that we couldn't win this election. But tonight, 
we prove that with hope, hard work, and the people by our side, anything is possible. Georgia, man, were you surprised? Yes, only because I refuse to allow myself hope. I know. Like we were on a text chain where uh, people were making predictions, um, and you you should feel free to gloat about yours, but I refuse to do it for <laughs> two reasons. One, we don't make predictions. Like that was a thing we pledged, and I don't know why yeah. you violated that. Uh, but <laughs> my, pred- publicly, my prediction was probably- publicly. My prediction was look. I'm transparent. Uh, my prediction was was going to be a loss, and I felt. You seemed really kind of on edge personally with the shoulder and the <laughs> pandemic. I didn't really want to run out of your parade. It, this, this is what I thought about both in pre- preparing for this podcast and thinking about everything that's happened in the last 48 hours in American politics is, one, it feels so discordant almost to talk about the joyous outcome in Georgia and then break down like what lessons did we learn and how do we win and how we increase turnout with what we just went through, right? We were going to start the podcast with the win. We were very excited to, we were very excited to, but imagine what yesterday and today would feel like if we'd lost in Georgia, if yeah. everything that had happened since the election had been, had led to Republicans being rewarded with more political power, with a right. validation of the idea that stealing elections and spreading conspiracy theories works. If, David Perdue and Kelly Leffler joined the coup the night before the election. If, and if the voters had then given them more, six more years, that would have been absolutely devastating. We at least are able to take – it's a small amount of comfort, granted, but it is comfort that Mitch McConnell becomes the minority leader. He loses the power to block Joe Biden's agenda. We have a lot of work to enact that agenda, but they have paid a political price, and it's a pretty steep one for their behavior both during the Trump years and since the election. And – that is that turn from that feeling turned from joy to relief after what we saw yesterday in my mind. Yeah, so I I don't know why I was so hopeful about Georgia the whole time. Because I was a complete anxious mess, as you know, before November. And even when on that text chain that we're on with and I'll say we're on with uh, Mitch Stewart, uh, you know, uh field organizing data genius from the Obama campaign. And Mitch like demanded that we all make predictions in November at the end. He said, just, just for me, tell me what's going to happen. And we all refused. Not, I, I, made, I made no map for November. I made no predictions. I was too worried, not even to myself. I made no predictions. But for some reason in Georgia, I started feeling, I just felt better about it. Um, and I've started feeling, I, part of the reason I felt better about it is because of what happened in Georgia in November, partly because I believe so much in Stacey Abrams and, and people like Latasha Brown and, uh, and say Ufoot who we're going to have on and all of these organizers in Georgia and all the work that they've done, but also like the environment just felt ripe for this. Um, and I had, I ended up predicting that Warnock would win by 90,000, He's currently up 75,000, but more vote out. Uh, and Ossoff would win by 80,000. He's currently up 37,000, more vote out. So I won't quite hit that one, but pretty close, pretty close. And I was saying, by the way, in early December, I was like, we're either going to win by a half a point or lose by a point. And some of our friends were saying down four, we're going to lose by four, which wrong. Um, but anyway, predictions aside. Predictions aside. So I want to talk about why we won. But first, what do we know about how this turnout and this coalition differed from the one in November, in which, at least in the Senate races, the Republicans slightly outperformed the Democrats, which, you know, this is the this is why this is so amazing here, right? Like, we just had an election in November. Um, Nate Cohn was calling it the perfect poll. The only perfect poll is an election. And we took the perfect poll in November. Um, David Perdue beat John Ossoff and the Republican candidates beat the Democratic candidates in the special election. And so in two months time, suddenly Democrats come back and win. What, what differed about the coalitions and the turnout? A, a couple of things are notable. One, Democrats turned out more than Republicans. And, mm-hmm. and Nate Cohn has a, did some cracks of math on this, which is, In precincts, it voted 80% for Biden in November. Turnout was 92% of of the November total. In districts that turned out for Trump at that same rate of 80%, 
it was 88%. So that 4% difference is gigantic. And, and so there was one more. more. In, in, in um, black districts, heavy yes. black districts, which were also 80% black or more, um, turnout was 93% of the November number, which was bigger than both the Biden districts or the Trump districts. And even more shocking than all of that to me is there were 140,000 people who had voted early in this runoff who did not vote in November. Unheard. Like two, months, very- two months in a special election when there's supposed to be less attention and, and more drop off. You had more vote. You had that uh, over 100,000 more voters who didn't even vote in November. And demographically, based on what we know from the early vote, that was a group that was largely favorable to Democrats. And that is incredibly notable. It is a that is the absolute tribute to grassroots organizing. That's the only way you find those people is through the hardcore work of organizing. And it is it's a it's a tremendous feat. And it goes against history. In relatively recent history, there have twice been Georgia senatorial runoffs after Democrats won the White House. In both cases, the Democrats lost, including in 1992, a Democrat incumbent losing because Democratic turnout was diminished through complacency, et cetera. And this time that didn't happen. Our turnout was, when you were at, in the 90% of November turnout on a runoff election, that happens three or four days after New Year's. It's unbelievable. It's, un- it's, un- I just, it's unheard of. It doesn't happen. It, there's, there are no historical examples of it happening that I've heard. Someone can... Uh, prove me wrong, but it just, it just, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen for, so I'm talking about the turnout. Turnout ended up being 4.4 million. All the prognosticators, a lot of, you know, folks who were on these campaigns, part of the state party, everyone, people believe that if turnout was north of 4.3 million, it would be good for the Republicans because it meant that they're going to match the Democratic turnout. And the fact that it hit 4.4 million and Democrats still won is I think an even larger testament to the Democratic turnout operation because, look, we're going to talk about how Republican turnout did sag more than Democratic turnout, but Republicans turned out in this race. They didn't, like, their turnout machine was strong. Like, getting 88% of, in the heavy Trump districts of their November turnout is still very, very good for a special election. But Democrats just did more. I want to point out just a few more uh, interesting nuggets here. Youth turnout and youth share of the vote went up. Uh, Biden won young voters by 11 points in November. Ossoff and Warnick won them by 34 points. So the share of youth voters went up. Uh, la- the Latino share of the vote went up. So they, they did better among the Latino voters who showed up than they did among the Latino voters who showed up in the general. Um, and then, as you mentioned, the 140,000 voters who voted in January who didn't vote in November were disproportionately young and people of color. Um, so two very heavily Democratic uh, groups. Three reasons you win a race. Organizing, candidate, message. Let's start with organizing. What happened here? And I know you're going to talk uh, to um, Ense about this more, but just as a top level. A culmination of a decade of work. That did not stop. No one took a day off. They went back to work the first Wednesday in November and kept organizing, kept turning people out. It was local organizing, community organizing, and it is what has happened in Georgia is the model for how we turn more of this country blue. And we have to learn everything there is to learn from the people involved and replicate their model because you cannot turn out the vote like that if you start 60 days before the election or even six months before the election or even a year before the election. It is the work that that takes happens in the odd years. It's the work that happens when no one's paying attention. And it is they, the organizers in Georgia, mostly black women, are heroes. They say, literally save the republic right here. And I just want to emphasize that point because, you know, there's a lot of people rightfully praising Stacey Abrams, we do it all the time here, but it's, 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 Obama used to say this to us too. He's like, sometimes people think I just like materialized on a stage in Boston to give that 2004 convention speech. I think sometimes people think Stacey Abrams just like materialized in 2018, just like suddenly showed up and gave a speech where she, uh, you know, talked about voter suppression and how Brian Kemp cost her the election because of his suppression. And she was a star there then. And that's the first, a lot of people heard of Stacey Abrams, right? Stacey Abrams worked for 10 years on this project, 10 years doing work that nobody wanted to do, 
going around, and she said this to you in, in your interview with her after um, after November, like just going around to people with a PowerPoint about why it's important to invest in Georgia because Georgia, the demographics are changing and it's it's the most diverse battleground state and it's the youngest battleground state. And if we organize and we register people, we can do this. And like a lot of the work of organizing and the work of winning, so much of it is not glamorous. It doesn't le- like it doesn't put you in the limelight. You don't get a lot of fame from it. You get a lot of rejection. There's a lot of losses. Stacey Abrams, in, aside from when she lost in 2018, she endured a lot of other losses. So did Georgia Democrats. So did the organizers in Georgia who've been working on this for the last 10 years. But they kept at it. And so a lot of these places that we look at today that seem like it's going to be hard to flip or that it's going to be too, you know, whatever, like these things don't happen in one cycle. And just because you lose one cycle doesn't mean that that state or that district should be out of reach for you for the next cycle or the cycle after that. Like this is the the work of organizing takes time. And that is why Stacey Abrams and and Latasha Brown and Ensay and all of these people, Lauren Gore, like all of these people who worked so hard in Georgia have um, have finally succeeded because they put in the work for so long. Um, look, they, they registered 75,000 voters between November and January, 75,000 voters they registered. More than half of them were under 35. They started knocking on doors again. That's a difference from the general election. There was in-person campaigning. Um, and, and I just want to give a, a shout out to everyone who participated in Vote Save America for this, especially our, our team at Crooked, who um, basically took no time off and then just worked through Thanksgiving and, and Christmas to get uh, adopt a state Georgia up and running. And then everyone who signed up, we had 41,000 people sign up for adopt Georgia to adopt Georgia uh, between uh, November and January, uh, raised $4.2 million for the Get Mitch Fund for Ossoff and Fair Fight Action, raised $1.65 million for our Every Last Vote Fund, which included Black Voters Matter, Mi Gente, and the New Georgia Product, made 108,000 calls to unregistered voters with the New Georgia Project Action Fund, and, uh, and we sent 5,000 volunteers distributed to local Georgia organizing groups on the ground. So uh, thank you to everyone who signed up to Adopt Georgia and who helped out and volunteered or donated in any way over the last couple of months. You really made a huge difference. Um, so as we said, you know, Democratic turnout dropped by less than Republican turnout. What role do you think Trump played in the, uh, the drop in Republican turnout? Obviously, two possibilities here. Republicans stayed home because Trump wasn't on the ballot. Or they stayed home because Trump, and to a greater extent, lunatics like Lynn Wood told them that the election was rigged. I think it's more the former than the latter. You think it's more that Trump wasn't on the ballot? Yes. If turn, Republican turnout was sky high, and if Democrat turnout had been lower than it was, we would have been blown away by how high the Republican turnout was. Yeah, for, for sure. the special election. That, like, you, we talked about how high the Democratic turnout was unprecedented. The Republican turnout is also unprecedented. It's just slightly less unprecedented, and therefore they lost. And so, the, like, we had this hope that Trump was going to convince all these people not to turn out because of the election rigging. But they apparently the Georgia voters got the winking and the nodding and went uh, and when it turned out. So I think it had more to do with Trump not being on the ballot. Also, Democrats doing a better job of organizing. Right? They, were, they out-organized Republicans. Um, and so it's more the Democrats won the race than Republicans lost it. I think that's very important. And as we think about what's well, going to be really interesting, because turnout was so high on both sides, is was this the last election of the Trump era? Or was it the first election of the post-Trump era? Does right. it tell us something about how that people are going to stay engaged at this incredibly high level post-Trump? Or, is this, or will we look back and say, this massive amount of engagement where politics was the dominating point of discussion in American life was unique to Trump. And I think that we're going to, that's something we're going to test and see out through, you know, throughout 2021 and in 22. And it's, it's, I think it's a really interesting question about where things are headed. Let's talk about the campaigns and their messages. Ossoff and Warnock hammered COVID relief throughout the campaign, especially at the end when McConnell blocked the $2,000 checks. Biden even focused on this message in his final campaign stop. He said, their election will put an end to the block in Washington on the $2,000 stimulus check. If you send Senator Perdue and Leffler back to Washington, those checks will never get there. It's just that simple. The power is literally in your hands. What role do you think that played? I played a huge role. I think yeah. it's, it, it is hard to know in the moment whether it was the checks specifically 
or that checks were the embodiment of a very effective narrative about Republicans. The, uh, with all of the, this is, I think is a great credit to John Ossoff, Raphael Warnock and their campaigns is Trump was the dominating omnipresent figure in the race. He was days before the election. He tried to bully the governor into overturning the results of the presidential election, engaged in multiple electoral crimes and moral travesties. He was in Georgia twice. He was tweeting about it all the time. Yet the Senate campaigns ran campaigns like we did in 2018. They pushed Trump into the background and brought the Republican Party and David Perdue and Kelly Leffler specifically into the foreground. And they ran against the, against Leffler and Perdue as callous, corrupt corporatists in the middle of a recession. And that proved to be a very powerful message. Now, as we think about how this plays out going forward, two incredibly wealthy senators who engage in insider trading to enrich themselves off the pandemic are particularly vulnerable to this attack. But I think it is it has I think there's some real lessons learned about how you talk about Republicans not named Trump and elections coming. I do think it's a there's two sides of the sort of Republicans are corrupt message. There's obviously the negative message about Republicans and there's the positive message about what you're gonna do. And I do think the two thousand dollar checks gave Democrats the ability to offer voters a tangible benefit to voting for them, which yes, is something yes, yes, that yes. we we often forget this. And and by the way, it's not just, you know, because Stacey Abrams made this point to me uh, in the wilderness, right, when we talked about sort of some of the more, the bigger, some of the more bigger progressive ambitious ideas. And she said, here's the thing, you need to be able to deliver for voters. And so you need to propose something that is going to make voters' lives better but also something that they believe that you can actually get done. Because if you promise them the moon and you can't deliver, then they're going to grow more cynical the next time and not, and not come out. And the $2,000 checks is something that the Democrats can deliver, right? Like it, it is very obvious that you can just, you can pass the bill. Joe Biden can sign the bill. You can send the checks. Like voters aren't stupid. They know, <laughs> they know what's possible and what's not possible. And um, I think rem, rem, Democrats should remember that when we are campaigning, that it's not sometimes, you know, there's a couple of problems with this. Sometimes we get lost in like tax credit speak and we're talking about expanding the EITC and that, you know, so sometimes we get way too in the weeds and it's benefits that people can't really understand. And it seems small and it seems like, you know, just nibbling around the edges. And then sometimes it's like big and vague promises, you know, like uh, that, that you make to voters that they know that you're not going to deliver. So I think specific policies that you know you can deliver to voters that actually improve their lives are incredibly important. That sounds obvious, but it doesn't happen enough. <laughs> and, and it's I hard. Think, it's hard to find them that are very tangible like that. That is very true. But I also think like as much as Warnock and Ossoff did a good job sort of calling out the corruption of these two Republican senators, I, I didn't see a tweet, an ad, anything from those two candidates where they didn't mention and we're about healthcare jobs and justice, healthcare jobs and justice, healthcare. You know, they had three things that they said over and over and over again, and then they had specifics backing that up. Um, so I thought that was pretty good. Do you have any other lessons that you think we can draw from this from this race going forward? I mean, the two lessons, one, I think the negative message again, or three lessons I would say, is negative message against Republicans around their, a populist economic critique of Republicans, pushing Trump out of the narrative as much as possible. Is your, your point, specific populist deliverables uh, in terms of policy. And then I think the other thing is they ran big, bold campaigns. They did yeah. They were not, they These were, were not, not centrists. They were not embarrassed to be Democrats. You see yeah. that a lot in a purple state. They were, they ran ads with John Lewis. They campaigned with Joe Biden. They ran ads with Barack Obama. They were proud Democrats who ran big, bold campaigns. They did, they ran from a position of strength and hope and not fear. And I, I, it did not have to be that way. You often see it in these, particularly in these runoff elections where you're trying to just win what you expect to be low turnout. They ran a very motivating race and they benefited from it. And I, I hope that lots of Democrats follow that lead in 21 and 22. I think there's something to learn from Raphael Warnock and his campaign. Um, I mean, we have the first black Democratic senator from the South. He ran... A, like you said, afraid, a campaign where he was unafraid to embrace being a Democrat or a black man in the South. And he also 
Kelly Loeffler ran an incredibly racist campaign against him and how he handled those racist attacks were, you know, there were the puppy videos and then it was also just constantly pivoting to his positive agenda, you know, and, and, and when you are getting attacked like that, when, when she's going after his church and going after things he said, and going after associations, all the racist dog whistles that they, that Republicans um, like to blow every single election. Um, there's a lot of pressure from your own campaign, from allies, from everyone else to hit back at every single one of those attacks. And it takes a lot of discipline to say, I'm going to pivot and say, she doesn't have anything to say about herself, so she's attacking me, and here's what I'm going to do for you. She's afraid that if I'm elected, I'm going to deliver on these stimulus checks, that I'm going to give people health care, that I'm going to help make this, make this country more just. And I think Warnock's message discipline and how he handled the racism leveled against him, and I think it's very similar to how Obama handled it, in some of his races. I think it's similar to how Stacey Abrams handled it in her race in 2018. Um, I think that is something for Democrats, especially Democrats of color who are running to learn from going forward. Um, and yeah, no, I think it, it's, I, I continue to just be amazed at what happened in Georgia, a state that has been red for so long, where we have a, a the first black Democratic senator a 33-year-old Jewish kid, <laughs> um, senators who did, who didn't run as scared centrists, right? They no, they, they didn't run as like you know democratic socialists either. <laughs> like they were, they talked about Medicaid expansion. They didn't talk about Medicare for all. They, Raphael Warnock ran ads where sheriffs talked about supporting him, and he attacked Leffler on stage and saying, you're the one who's defunded the police with your votes uh, against state and local funding, right? So they, they didn't really run too far to the left, but they definitely didn't run to the center either. <laughs> they were just Democrats, mainstream Democrats, who were proud of what they stood for. And they had an agenda. And they had a story about the other side. And sometimes that's it. Sometimes that's what you need. That's all you need. What I think is so important about Warnock's victory is one of the things that I've really been concerned about over the last couple of years is whenever you talk to someone like Stacey Abrams or Andrew Gillum or someone, a candidate of color who is trying to run statewide, the hardest part is convincing donors, party types, institutional supporters that you can win. And yeah. I was very, very worried about how narrow the presidential race was, where Joe Biden a 70-something white man from Scranton barely won the Electoral College. What that would say about the ability of candidates, black candidates, Latino candidates, Asian candidates to run and win statewide in purple and red states. And yeah. you saw, we saw that in how the electability question was during the Democratic primary among our voters was filtered through race and gender. And... We have a lot, so much work to do on this, but Raphael Warnock has proven that in a very tough race, again, where you're running against an incumbent president who is in an incredibly him, competitive state, incredibly competitive state, you can win. And that is, that is a huge deal. And I hope that we remember that as we think about who our candidates are in races all across this country. Um, I totally agree. We, so it's very, I think it's very, very important. And it is glad, I'm glad that we could end on Georgia because it is, this is a, a very dark and scary set of things that we are dealing with as a country and I'm talking about right now and that there is this positive thing that matters a lot and bodes well for our ability to navigate what is to come in American life because you've proven how to do it in Georgia. And we should also end by talking about not just what it means for history or what it means for electoral politics, but what it's actually going to mean for Joe Biden and the country to have a Democratic majority. We have a Democratic majority now. We got Mitch. Uh, <laughs> for one, um, Republicans can no longer block any of Biden's nominees if Democrats just hold together. All the complaints about Neera Tandon or Javier Becerra or anyone else we've heard about do not matter. John Cornyn and Lindsey Graham can cry about mean tweets all they want. They can go fuck themselves. Just, just complain all you want about mean tweets. You don't matter. Uh, number two. <laughs> Biden can actually pick some judges uh, and start filling judicial vacancies, including the Supreme Court. Um, I believe Justice Breyer is 82. Um, so nice, might be a nice time to retire. 
<laughs> Breyer. <laughs> because we have a Democratic president, Democratic majority. Might not last forever, so you might want to start looking at your calendar. Um, <laughs> and not like he's going to listen to us. You think Justice Breyer listens to Pod Save America? Probably not. Uh, and, and so both of these points, the nominees and the judicial vacancies, uh, come into play with Biden's announcement on Wednesday that his pick for attorney general is none other than Merrick Garland. Um, Dan, what do you think about the pick? And what impact did Georgia have on that pick? It's very notable that Joe Biden waited until the races were called to make this choice because Merrick Garland sits on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the second most powerful court in the land. When Obama was president, one of the reasons why Harry Reid got rid of the filibuster for judges is because Mitch McConnell filibustered every single nominee to that court. He shrunk the court. Right, Mr. I care so much about court packing. He shrunk the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals for all intents and purposes to prevent Obama from getting nominees. And so were McConnell to still be in control of the Senate and Biden were to pick Garland, that seat would certainly never go filled in Biden's first term, for sure. And so I imagine that that someone else might have been the nominee if Georgia had gone differently. Because it, it, he, ha, he has made almost all of his appointments. He ha, this is one of the big four, as they're called. And he certainly held it until this moment. He clearly wanted to pick Garland, and the, the voters of Georgia let him do it. Merrick Garland is a tremendous public servant. He has a tremendous record. I had the privilege of sitting in uh, when he was one of the short in the interview when he was one of the shortlisters to be on the be an Obama pick on the Supreme Court back in 2009 and is a truly phenomenal human being. Everyone We have lots of friends who have clerked for him, know him, and think he is uh, tremendous. And the team he put together, that it's not just Merrick Garland. Lisa Monaco, our former co-worker, is going to be deputy. Vanita Gupta is going to be the associate attorney general. And Kristen Clark is going to be in charge of civil rights. He has picked two, and this is very notable, he has picked two civil rights leaders to be in charge, uh, to play senior roles in the Justice Department. And that's a huge thing. And I think this is a very, uh, a very, very good team. There's also some reports that um, Biden could or has been thinking about replacing Garland on the um, D.C. Court of Appeals with Katanji Brown Jackson. Um, she is a 50 year old black woman who currently sits on the federal district court uh, in D.C. and also as someone who has been mentioned as a possible Supreme Court justice. And so she could go to Phil Merrick Garland's seat on the D.C. Circuit on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. And then perhaps if Breyer retires, you could get Katanji Brown Jackson as, on the Supreme Court um, and, and elevate a, a very young black woman to the Supreme Court of the United States, which would be awesome. Um, so a uh, lot of good things came from what just happened in Georgia. What else can we expect from a Democratic Senate and where are we still going to face challenges? Well, we're going to face challenges in that the filibuster still exists. So to pass most things, not nominations, not court appointments, but most pieces of legislation, and there are a few exceptions we can talk about, we still need 10 Republicans. And Mitch McConnell still has say under that scenario, under large portions of the Biden agenda. And even still, we have Joe Manchin, a very conservative Democrat, Kirsten Sinema, Mark Kelly from Arizona, more moderate Democrats who have concerns with some of the more progressive elements of the Biden agenda, some of the more important structural reforms like turning D.C. into a state or some of those sorts of things. Um, so this is hard. Uh, I... 50-50 Senates are very, very challenging. They take a long time to organize. There's some pretty intense negotiations between the majority and the minority about how you set up, how many people are on each committee and how you set it up and all of that. So this is an incredibly narrow path to get things done, but it is a path. And that would not exist under any scenario if we had not won both of those seats on Tuesday. A few points here, because as you know, Dan, I, I have some concerns about the filibuster. And I have for a while. Um, <laughs> the reason that we can't, you might be thinking, why can't we get rid of the filibuster? Like we said we wanted to. Well, because Joe Manchin doesn't want to get rid of the filibuster. You need 50, we, need, we need 51 votes to get rid of the filibuster, um, which we have. We have 50, Democrats have 51 votes, but we do not have 51 Democratic senators who want to get rid of the filibuster, namely Joe Manchin. Um, possibly some others, too. Like, I, I don't know that 
Yeah, I don't know that Kirsten is. But like some of them, you could imagine pressuring. You could imagine saying the voters of your state are going to, you know, punish you if you don't eliminate the filibuster and we're going to have a primary challenge and all that kind of stuff. Joe Manchin, there's none of that. <laughs> Joe, there, we're not getting another Democrat out of West Virginia, probably in our lifetime. <laughs> um, maybe I'm wrong. I shouldn't say that. At least in the next 10 years, let's say. <laughs> we're not getting another Democratic senator out of Virginia. And certainly not another Democratic senator out of West Virginia who is more liberal than Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin doesn't care about your pressure campaigns. He doesn't care about you calling his office and yelling at him. He, he, he won a seat recently. He's there for a while. And he's just going to be Joe Manchin. And I hate that. You hate that. But like that is the reality that we have. So the question is, can we ever get to a point where there's legislation that comes to the floor that's so important that McConnell is obstructing so much that we somehow can convince, and by we, I really mean Joe Biden and his administration, because again, Joe, Joe Manchin doesn't respond to popular pressure and is somewhat insulated from political pressure. Um, can Biden ever convince Manchin to change his position on the filibuster? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, the other opportunity we have is you mentioned most legislation requires 60 votes. There is something called a budget reconciliation bill where we can pass that bill with only 51 votes. What can you put in a, bu a budget reconciliation bill? Well, first of all, you're only allowed, I believe, one per year. You can stuff whatever you want in that so long as it is about taxing and spending and has to do with actually changing the budget itself. So what can get done within budget reconciliation with 51 votes? The $2,000 checks can get done. Um, Democrats can expand eligibility for Obamacare subsidies. Um, they can get Medicare to negotiate for better prescription drug prices that way. You can actually change the Medicare age, the age of eligibility for Medicare within budget reconciliation, which Joe Biden, because of Bernie Sanders, has promised to bring down five years. Um, I read that you can possibly do a public option within budget reconciliation. Tax hikes for the rich, anything that has to do with taxes, you can do in budget reconciliation, which means climate spending, investment that has to do with climate. Um, you can do some immigration things uh, within budget that have to do with money, but still a lot of immigration stuff would actually have to be real legislation. Um, and then the things that you can't do are minimum wage, immigration, guns. And then this is the big one that worries me that I wanted to ask you about is all of these democracy voting reforms that we know we need to pass in order to make sure that we can still have free and fair elections again. Like, what do we do about HR1, which we've talked about before, um, which is the House Democracy Reform Bill um, that they are going to rename the John Lewis Voting Rights Act? What do we do about that bill? Is that, is that, is that dead on arrival? Does Biden try it anyway? What do you think? It, I don't want to say dead on arrival, but there is not, no plausible path to 10 Republicans supporting something that helps black people and brown people vote. There's no, there's no recent history of that being the case. However, I think it's critically important that Biden, in the appropriate order, calls the question. We can't just presume Mitch McConnell's obstruction. We have to force him to actually obstruct to things for two reasons. One, so that we can create a paper trail of the costs of the Republican Senate for when we are going to go be trying to defeat Republican senators in 2022. And if you want to make a case, if Joe Biden wants to do this, and Joe Biden is very reticent on the filibuster, that's the most, even as important as Joe Manchin, is Joe Biden is not someone like Elizabeth Warren or Pete Buttigieg or some others who are running for president who are very adamantly opposed to the existence of the filibuster. Joe Biden, as close as he came during the campaign, was to say he was open to the idea if Mitch McConnell was obstreperous, I think was his term. Now, Mitch McConnell was obviously going to be obstreperous, so he, he opened the door wide for it. But let's test the proposition on all of these issues of the things that are very important, that have huge majority support in the American people, from the American people, that Mitch McConnell wants to stop. So let's make him stop them. Let's make Marco Rubio stop these things. Let's make Ron Johnson stop these things. Let's make the people that we are going to try to defeat in 2022 go on the record blocking popular legislation. Let's not, let's not presume to that. Let's not, let's not assume their obstruction and so avoid them. Now, when I say do it in the proper order, I think there's going to be a real question about what that budget reconciliation bill is. How soon do you do it? How important is it to 
fill in the gaps of the very meager COVID relief bill that was passed last month. How yes. quickly do you get these checks out? Like that is going to require being the budget reconciliation bill. So is that something that's going to move very early? And should that move? The House can do things like this, right? So they'll, they like Nancy Pelosi, pick whatever. If you want to do HR1 first and then come around and do the other thing, that's great. The Senate takes much more time. It's much harder. And so it is a real, um, you know, there's a, I'm very curious to see how the order in which Biden prioritizes these things um, and how quickly he wants to play that budget reconciliation card in his presidency. I would on, I would go very hard on the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. I would put it on the floor if I was Schumer and just dare Mitch McConnell and those Republicans. If you want to filibuster it, like actually filibuster it, sit on, get on the Senate floor and just talk about why you don't want to expand voting rights. And I don't think that's necessarily going to shame Republicans, but, you know, maybe the pressure builds at that point. Like, Joe Manchin, do you want the Republicans to filibuster a bill named after John Lewis about voting rights? That's that's what we're going to let them filibuster? Like, I, I think that, you know, whether we win or lose on that one, I would, I would spend a lot of my capital on that um, because I think that, you know, we don't pass some of these democracy reforms, voting reforms. I get pretty worried about elections in 2022 and 2024 and 2026 and beyond. We have redistricting this year. That's going to be tough for us. Like, you know, we know we already saw in Georgia, right? They're, they're getting ready to pass a raft of voter restrictions in Georgia. Um, and look, there's limited stuff that you can do on the federal level, but HR1 is a good bill. And I think that the Democrats should push very, very hard for it and make it very, very clear whose fault it is if it doesn't pass and do everything they can to pass it. I mean, this is the cent- this is the central issue. Everything flows from it. And when we talk about Mitch McConnell nurturing this lie about a stolen election, and we talk about it in the context of jacking up turnout in Georgia, that's part of it. The longer re- term reason why all the Republicans who definitely knew better allowed this lie to fester is because it creates pretext for more voter suppression. This is going to happen yeah. all across the country. And th- this is the last throws of a shrinking white conservative majority in a in a country defined by a diverse, growing progressive majority. And we we, we are going to have some limits on what we can do in the Senate, but we got to call the question. We got to fight on it. We got to talk about it. We got to make it the defining issue because everything else we care about flows from that. All right. Everyone have a good weekend. We'll talk to you next week.